I've been saving cars and restoring cars for almost 22 years now. He said, but I remember building that. He said, I can't believe it's still here. This was one of my luckiest finds ever, an ad in a, ma in, in a magazine. All right, Bill Ryan, you got me out here in the woods in North Carolina, and uh, I really don't know where I am because i just following you out here. So tell me a little bit about what uh, Ryan Enterprises is doing these days. So, well, we've pretty much become the world leader in vintage stock car restorations. Not only do we restore cars for clients that keep them in collections, we also restore cars for clients who race them. There's a large group of folks that still enjoy racing these old pieces and, and having quite a good time with them. Um, one of the bigger things we do is we save stuff. We, 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 you know, the cars, the parts, the pieces, the, you know, just anything we can find that we believe is a part of history, buy it, get it, put it back so that it's saved and it doesn't get scrapped or destroyed somewhere. Okay, so it's all in here? A bit of it's in here, yeah, a good bit. All right, well, I'm ready to see. You've been wanting me to see this, so. <laughs> all right, open the door. Let's see what right. you got. All right, come on in. Let me get, get the right. door. And we got uh, Cabbage the Shop Dog to yep. come, come with on, us. Cabbage. All right, Cabbage. Let's see. Oh, my. Are you serious? We have a few toys. A few. Oh, wow. Oh my lord. <laughs> this is unbelievable, Bill. I told you'd be impressed. All hidden in a barn here yes. in North Carolina. Yes. Yes. Uh, how many do you have? Um, restored and unrestored, I have 64. 64? Total, yeah. And those are your personal cars. That's not, yeah. these are not customer cars. These are yours. Yes. Yes. I've been saving cars and restoring cars for almost 22 years now. Well, there's a lot of uh, names and numbers I certainly recognize, and uh, the different liveries obviously all are very, very familiar. Um, what incredible combinations. All right, well, let's begin with Jeff right here. What, what, which one is this? Uh, this is a 2012 Watkins Glen car, and this is restored 100% all Hendrick parts and pieces from their brake assemblies to their R07 engine to their carbon dash. I'm, I'm, I'm really a stickler on that. My older cars have the 23 degree motors. If it was a snowflake motor, it's a snowflake motor. If it was a Pontiac headed motor, it's a Pontiac motor. If it was a Hendrick motor, it's a Hendrick motor. I'm, 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 there's a lot of guys who restore old race cars and put the biggest, baddest, craziest race engine they can in it so it goes faster. And that's cool and there's a market for that and that's great. But all of my stuff is as it raced when it was famous. So you're I'm super concerned. meticulous. I am. I really am. Yeah. To a point of crazy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, how about the, I mean, the Hawaiian Tropic Donnie Allison car. I mean, that, that is epic. That's a beautiful piece. Yeah, that, that's actually, um, that, actually, that's the one in the building that's not ours. That's for a client of ours in, in Canada. He's retired Special Forces, super cool guy. And um, he found the hot rod and brought it to us, and we put it all back together for him. And Some of these things I would, I would assume are pretty easy to verify, you know, something like a Hendrick car. <laughs> Like this, or, or Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s machine mm -hmm. over there, but something like this Kale Yarborough uh, Valvoline car. A, where do you find it? And then B, how do you confirm it is what it looks like it is? Well, we get that question a lot, actually. And, and so people ask, well, how do you verify all your cars? I don't. The guys who built them and race them verify them for me. We have a really amazing network of friends in the industry who, who have, you know, done this for their whole lives. And we go find them and we get them in front of the car and, and they tell us yay or nay, real or not. And it's really fun to watch these guys see their old stuff. Yeah. Um, tell you a neat story on that thing real quick, on that Earnhardt, Earnhardt car. Wrangler car. We had one of the fabricators come by, Marv Acton. And we had all the parts in boxes, and, and we knew what the car was, so we bought it. But we wanted to, you know, just verify through all the all the people who worked there. And Marv comes by and looks at this thing, and he's fishing through all the boxes. He's like, "That looks like it." And he was telling a couple little stories, and then he finds these brake horns, these aluminum, funny shaped brake duct scoops. And he saw it in the box, and he picked it up out of the box, and he says, "Oh my God, Bill!" He said, "I built that for Dale Inman." He said, "I remember that." I said, "I thought that was the craziest, stupid thing with this shape on it." He said, but I remember building that. He said, I can't believe it's still here. 
and it was still with the car. All Instant the, verification. Yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, this back to this one, David If came out and verified this. He was a crew chief for sure. Kale back then, and he told us this was one of the two banjo cars they bought that year. This was the 500 car in 81. It was bodied as an Oldsmobile for the 500. It was rebodied as a Buick after the Daytona 500 and ran the rest of the season, which is why we put it back as a Buick. Um, but the guys who were there, who lived it, you know, I, I like what NASCAR is, but I love what it was. I love what those guys did and how they raced and, and, and just everything about it just so cool well and i'm assuming when you find these things they're not in the spectacular condition oh, you've no. got them in now so even just knowing i mean was this wrangler car even yellow and blue when you first saw it there was some leftover blue paint on the roof um it had been blasted the gentleman out west who bought it actually from booby harrington while he was the team manager at, at austerlands uh he raced it for several years and his son had stripped it to restore it Realized it was a little more of a project than he wanted, so we bought it from him, put it back together like it should be. And um, as you can see, we've got Doug Richard, Lou La Rosa, Marv Acton, Jeff Collins, all original oh, yeah. crew members that signed the dash of the car. And she is put back together with an original uh, snowflake head, aluminum 23 degree motor, Jerry Stahl headers, the old Jerry Stahl headers on it. Um, and, and we go to the point of we're the only guys in the country who can rebuild the Hurst Earhart brake calipers. We remade pistons from scratch, redone seals from scratch. We overbore everything just a little bit to get all the corrosion out. Everything we can't get anymore, brass radiators, aluminum radiators, the large core stuff, we rebuild everything from scratch. We have to because you can't get it anymore. So you have incredible craftsmen working with you. I do. Making this stuff happen. Where, where are you finding? Finding the car is one thing, but finding somebody that can build that radiator like that yeah. is almost more challenging than finding the car. Yes. So wh where do you find these guys these days? Um, you know, we've been very fortunate. We have quite a great network of people. Again, like our race car friends, our fabrication employees and friends are, are, are just as good and, and, and equally as important to making all this happen. Well, I could stand here and talk about senior all day, but I mean, DW right here. That's a Is this a real junior, junior car? Junior Johnson? Oh yeah, the junior signed the dash for me. He sure did, look at he that. Mm-hmm. We took it up. Now, this was a fun story. So we, we found this car, we restored it, and I decided for fun we would take it up to Junior's for breakfast, not tell him, and drive it up the driveway and park it out front and just go in for breakfast. And we did it, you know, we did it for Junior, but it ended up really turning out to be something cool for us because all of my guys that worked on this car got to go eat breakfast at Junior's. Have some One of Flossie's time. biscuits. Yes. And three months after we did Man. this, they sold the property and breakfast was done forever. So all of my team got to enjoy breakfast at Junior's one time before it didn't exist anymore. And, and that was the coolest part of this whole deal. Um, we did it for Junior, but it ended up being for us because we all got to enjoy uh, a really neat part of racing. Now, has Daryl seen this? He has. He has. He knows of it. And actually, we have his race helmet up there in a plastic tote. Well, that, I see it right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... What do, you, what do you got hidden in the boxes up there? Everything. I'm seeing models and hats and... Everything we can save. Um, so you're have, a pack rat, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. The Fred G. Sanford of the racing world. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so. your stuff's a little more valuable than Fred's was. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. So, um, that, and, that's, and that's an interesting question. What is... Uh, not for you to give up the value of what you have, but how are vintage stock cars doing these days in the collector market? A lot better than they used to. I would say for the last 10 years, they were great, and then they went through about a 10 or 12 year lapse of value, mostly because there's a ton of fake stuff out there. And we fight that every single day. People call us like, hey, I bought this car. Well, we know that car, it's not real. Well, they said it was, of course they said it was real. They're trying to sell it to you. You know, call me first. We know pretty much for most, 99% of the real stuff is. And, you know, we know enough people that if we don't know, we can call somebody and ask. You know, a Tex Pal or a Lou La Rosa or, you know. Yeah. And, and they know. And so because of the fakes, it's hurt the value of the market. The market is starting to come back around as far as phone calls were getting interest. You know, Ray Abraham's doing this now. Dale Jr.'s collecting some stuff now. That's all building to the effect of them becoming what they should be in value. Um, but, but currently when somebody calls me and says, hey, I got this car, I want to restore it, if it's real and it's worth doing, you say, you know, you're probably going to spend more restoring it than it's worth right now. But in five years' time, I don't think that's going to be the case anymore. The other thing about these vehicles is 
They're great for vintage racing. Yes. Because they're pretty much bulletproof in a lot of ways. Yes. Right? We, we had a client from Florida who used to race the Ferrari Challenge Series. Yeah. And we put him in a NASCAR and he had a blast with the thing. And the, the fun, th these things on bias by tires on a road course are one of the funnest things you will ever drive. <laughs> they're also one of the safest cars you can put your sure. butt in. And I remember the guy from Florida coming up and, and he broke a transmission at, at Kershaw one day and we fixed it in, you know, 20 minutes. New transmission in, out the door, back on the track. And he came in at the end of the day, he says, you know, he said, when I broke a transmission in my Ferrari, it was $22,000 in three months before I could race my car again. He said, you guys had my car back on the road in 30 minutes. I said, yeah, that's, you know, and as a $4,500 transmission. So, yeah, win-win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Uh, I mean, obviously, a wide variety of generations here, too, and, and not all cup cars, because this is a Rob Moroso car, Correct. right? That's the, champ that's the Bush car. Yes, championship winning uh, Speedway car. That was their big track car that year. That has the original V6 in it just like they ran back in the day. Um, not a big fan of those motors, but no. I have several V6 cars and we put V6s back in them because that's what they raced. Um, Pretty much how she came off the track too, huh? Yeah. That yeah. one was actually vintage raced by a great friend of mine in Florida. Um, passed away from cancer a couple years ago and, and we bought his collection from his wife when, when he was getting sick and just making sure she was okay. We bought all his engine stuff, his trailer, his tools, his parts, his cars, everything. Just because that one over there, that's actually the Rob Moroso Cup car. So the year he won the Bush Championship, he ran three cup races. He ran a Moroso car at Richmond, a Preston Antifreeze car at Dover, and a Swisher Sweet car at Atlanta. That is a Swisher Sweet car from Atlanta. From Atlanta. So we have both the Cup and the Bush Swisher Sweet car, yeah. which is really cool. Yeah. And how about the, the Mark Martin Folgers car? Is that that was the road course car from 89 and 90. Well, Mark was outstanding as a road course racer. Is it a he was. race winner? No, it was actually, uh, <laughs> it walked into Glen in 1990. He got in a wreck with Dick Trickle and Troy Beebe in practice. They came up the hill. Troy Beebe was parked sideways in the racetrack from spinning out, and they clobbered him. Dick huh. got a relief driver for the race. Mark ran the race in his backup car. Uh, when we found this, it still had all the original stickers and, and paint on it. It was just the right front tire was pushed into the firewall. Oh, wow. So we fixed it, repaired it, um, and put it back like you see it now. And actually, uh, Mark drove that at Darlington a couple years ago. No kidding. Before the race, yeah. Yeah. How much of that do you do as far as um, corporate things or display stuff with these vehicles? Because obviously, if people are looking for some history, uh, you pretty much have it all. We do, and, and we don't... We don't do a lot with these. We kind of just keep them hidden. Um, we bring military tours out here six or eight times a year when we do our military dinners at the shop. So, so we do that. Um, what we have done, specifically with Valvoline and Wrangler, when their corporate people call us and say, hey, we'd like to use some cars for something, well, we let them use them. We don't charge them. You know, we just let them use them and, and have fun with them. I mean, they're, they're, Valvoline's the reason we have cool Valvoline cars. If they didn't sponsor these NASCARs back then, then we wouldn't have a Neil Bonnet NASCAR and a Kelly Yarbrough, you know, car. And so, you know, we just, we kind of, we help them out when we can. Yeah. Um, incredible. So Ron Bouchard over here, you got a lot of Valvoline mm -hmm. stuff. Rusty looks like about championship year. Well, it'd be after the championship actually, because it was Kodiak then. Correct. So this Correct. is a Penske car? First year Penske. So in, in, as we were told by Don Mill, and this actually is signed by Don Mill, the president of Penske. Yeah, right here. When Blue Max won the championship in 89, they were bankrupt. Yeah. The team pretty much folded. Yeah. Don Miller and Rusty Wallace bought the team for the 1990 season. They made it the 27 Miller Genuine Draft car for 1990. They won two races, had a decent year. Um, Roger Penske came in in 1991, bought the team from them. They both kept a small percentage of ownership. They became the number two Miller Genuine Draft cars. At that point, Roger Penske bought four Ronnie Hopkins chassis, and those were the start of his NASCAR fleet. This is PRS-002. This was the second Hopkins chassis that Penske bought, and then soon after that, they started building their own cars, but this is one of those original four. And Rusty used to name all of his cars, Brandy and Midnight and all that. Yes. Uh, does this one have a, does it have a name to it? Or? You know, I talked to John Dodson and Don Miller, and neither of them could tell me what the name of this car was. So I don't know the name of it, but we do know it's Penske Racing South 002. Pretty, pretty good bet it did have a nickname, though, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, and, and the name on the door behind you there doesn't get much more famous than that one. Uh, AJ didn't, I mean, he ran, obviously, a NASCAR, but that looks like a USAC car. That is. That is actually 
This was one of my luckiest finds ever. This was just something, I, uh, looking at an, an ad in a, ma in, in a magazine, actually Speed Sport magazine, way back when. The <laughs> Thanks little, for the support the little, and the shout out. <laughs> yeah, the little paper classifieds yeah. in the back. I saw this thing for sale and I'm like, I'm not familiar with AJ's Camaro. So I started doing some research and a really cool guy in Ohio had bought it straight from the AJ Foyt auction in Indy. And so this is the two-time USAC championship Camaro, unrestored original. Oh. It has nine wins, 11 poles, and two championships in two years, and it is, I mean, I've had several people want to buy this car, and when their second question is, what's it going to cost to restore it? I'm like, you can't have it. Yeah. Everything needs restored. One day, this will need restoration, but for now, I really want to leave it just like we found it, because well, it's as raced original. But isn't that more valuable? So, and that's a big argument sometimes, right? Especially in the collector car world, um, is a big block 427 Corvette, you know, more valuable with original miles and original paint as opposed to a completely restored version. Same thing there. It depends on the collector. I mean, that would have AJ's DNA in it right, right. now the way it oh, is. That's his duct tape all over the seat. Yeah, yeah. so why, why, would you, <laughs> why would you change that, right? That, that's why we, I've left it like it is. You know, we find everything we find, and, and I can go to the other building in a minute and show you the unrestored cars so you can see some of the stuff as we find it <laughs> and how rough it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, I guess it depends on the car, right? Where I could see where maybe this Penske Pontiac you might want to restore, but something like that well, is pretty impressive. Yeah, well, exactly. And, and to me, it, usually it's not that you want to, it's that you have to. When you uh, find this and it was sold by Penske and raced by an ARCA team and wrecked three times and, you know, and when you get it, it's, it's got a, you know, wadded up front end on it and it's rusted because it's been sitting outside, then you have to restore this to make it valuable, to put it back like it was. So when you find one like this that you don't have to, golly, don't. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, I see two 45s over there. Is one Kyle and one Adam? Yes. Yes, I, I, I believe I have the only Adam Petty car that ever left Petty Enterprise. Um, he was my absolute favorite person in racing He's as a, great a driver, kid. as a person. Fantastic yes. kid. Yes, and um, that was chassis 4507. I worked for Adam in 1999 when we uh, ran his rookie season in the Bush Series. And we wrecked that car at South Boston. And so that's I, a Bush car. It is. Mm -hmm. And I was putting it back together at my house because Adam and I were talking about trying to run some more road racing stuff. He, he wanted to be a better race car driver, period. He was committed. Yes. He 100%. was fully committed. Yes. And um, I tell people he's the best to Lee, the best to Richard, and the best to Kyle, all in one person. He was. He really was. He would have been some. And um, so we um, were putting it back together to do some, some practice road racing so he could, you know, be a better road racer. And, and when he passed away, I just kind of put it up for a while. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to put it back like it was when we ran it at... Uh, Nazareth, Pennsylvania, we finished fourth with that car. Mm. So that was actually our best short track car. That car took 460 pounds of lead for a short track car. I won't tell you some of the little tricks we did to make it that light, but that <laughs> was a really wicked car when we had it. So it was a great piece. And um, so she sits out here, and, and she stays covered up most of the time. But um, that, that is, if pe when people ask me what's for sale, I don't sell much ever, really. But that's never for sale. Yeah. That's the one that I'll own as long as I'm on this planet because I just, I mean, that's. I couldn't imagine parting with anything you have in here, to be honest with you. Um, for those that don't know, how did you get to this point? What was your history in stock car racing that where you learned about all this? Because you obviously have a passion for it. Um, well, I was born and raised in Miami, Florida which back then there was no racing in Miami, Florida. Yeah, that's why the Allisons left, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I left home when I was 15, finished high school living with Miss Pasiak. As soon as I got out of high school, bailed out to go to Georgia to go racing and just went from you know Southern All-Stars to NASCAR Slim Jim All-Star to Randy Porter's Bush Grand National Team and anywhere I could work. And, and I, 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 I've always lived with the rule that if I work twice as many hours as you today, I'm going to learn twice as much as you did today. And so I worked places with Ricky Craven's Bush Shop. Um, geez, Pete, we worked, you know, 100 hours a week there. We loved going to the racetrack because they threw you out of the garage at 5. You had to, <laughs> you leave had to at go 5 o'clock. Yeah. yeah. So um, the racetrack was a vacation for us. Um, but I learned a ton from Ricky Craven and, and loved the time I spent there. It was hard. Trust me, it was hard. I'm writing a book about it one of these days. But, but it, was, it was what I needed at the time. And I learned so much there and so much at Adam Petty's with, with guys like uh, you know, Butch Lamoureux and Pete Yankopoulos and brilliant fabricators and brilliant thinkers. And I just, 
suck everything in. When I would leave Ricky Cravens at night at 10 o'clock, I'd go to Andy Santer's shop and hang bodies with a guy at night because I want to learn how to hang better bodies. You know, do that till one or two in the morning, then go home, sleep for four or five hours, and then go back to work. I mean, that's just, that's, that's what I did constantly. And it's been, it's, uh, it's worked. <laughs> yeah, and it's got you here. So here's another junior car. Yeah. What's, what's the history on this? Uh... So that one was, that was a Hendrick car that was sold to Haas. Super nice guy. Um, but when his team went out of business, we bought a couple of his cars and a couple of his engines that he had. And in Hendrick fashion, when they sell the car, they grind the serial number off of it. Oh, I really? probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to tell you the secret. They never take the rear clip tag off. They don't, so they, when I got they, this, they're not aware of that? No, or? I don't think they're aware of it. So They are, <laughs> they are now. now. <laughs> yeah. So I got this car from, from them, and I ripped their wrap off of it, and it, still, it had the blue and white underneath. So I called my buddy at Haas. I said, hey, can you give me an information on the car you sold to Extreme? They said, we bought it from Hendrick, but we never used it, so we have no history on it. So I called an engineering friend of mine at Hendrick and said, hey, here's this rear clip number. Can you please run this through the system and see what chassis you welded this on? Well, he told me that it was a car that Dale Jr. ran... Bristol and Michigan and the backup at Indianapolis in 2013. So that's where we put, we put her back to that livery. And um, it's just a cool piece. It's just a super cool car and, yeah. and a great, great race car driver slash, you know, great historian. He's all about oh, this he's stuff all, too. Yeah, he's all eat up with it yeah. too. And then, and then you get to something like this. You know, that's what I love about this, this building just looking through here is you've got every genre, these two right here. Yeah. Um, Jody Ridley and Ricky Rudd. So this must have been very early in Ricky's career. It was. Uh, and then you got Lenny Pond and Harry Gant yeah. on the door on this one. Driving for Butch Mock and Bobber Healy. Yeah. Right. And so, another cool thing here. I had Bobber Healy build the engine for this because I wanted it just like it was supposed to be, you know, top mount alternator, just yeah. like the old days. And I had both Butch and Bob sign it. Again, one of our brass radiators we restored yeah. from scratch. Um, this is kind of a funny thing because I've learned with this, if you're going to have these guys sign one of their cars, let Bob sign it first. <laughs> Butch sign it second. Let Bob sign it first. Um, both of them, I uh, love them both to death. They're super cool people. Um, Bob's done actually several older motors for me. All of them are absolutely spectacular. Um, I just love it, love it, love it. They have a, a colored history in NASCAR, but they're both just awesome guys. Yeah. Super awesome guys. Boy, what a big car though too, huh? I know. And you would be surprised how well this thing handles. You would be amazed. That, that's what most people who see these things say, like, oh, they, you know, they must, you know, the, the Porsche guys. Yeah. Oh, they drive like boats. No, they don't. They look like boats. They yeah, don't drive right, like boats. Right, as big as a boat. <laughs> yeah. Boy, and solid too, huh? Yeah. Just, I mean, yeah. compared this to some of the newer stuff, it's just yes. way different in weight. Mm-hmm. Huh? Yeah. You can fit six people under that engine compartment. You sure yeah. could. You sure could. Well, and you got another Earnhardt piece over here. Uh, different era though, right? Yes. Same color scheme, different era. Yes. And when, actually, when I found this car originally and we started doing the, the tracking on it, I thought we had a good wrench car from like 1988. Yeah. And um, I had Lou come out and La look Rosa. at it. Yeah, Lou La Rosa. Yeah. Championship winning engine builder, 81, 86, 87. Yep. Super cool guy. If you ever get a chance to talk to him about racing, what a hoot. Yeah. Man. What a hoot. Um, he came out and looked at it he, and he just. He blew my whole deal. He's like, you don't got a good wrench car, boy. Or, yeah, a good wrench car. He says, you got a Wrangler car. And I'm like, well, how do you know? He said, the oil tank's still in the left front corner. He said, in 1987, we put all the oil tanks inside the car in a metal box. He said, this one's still in the left front corner, so this car never raced after 1986. He said, you got an 84, 85, 86 Speedway version Childers car. That's what you got. He said, but you ain't got a good wrench car. And I wanted a good wrench car because I already owned a Wrangler car. Right. Well, no, I got two Wrangler cars, which is still very cool. Yeah, what a problem but, to have. Yeah. <laughs> But he was, he was so, Les Bars, Richie Bars, Lou La Rosa, Tex Pal, they still remember everything, everything. Even actually Will Cronkite, the old Jolly Rancher car back there, um, he still remembers tons and tons of stuff. And um, it, it's so much fun to sit down and talk to these. That, that's actually one of the, my favorite things. It's, it, it's cool to own the cars, but it's even cooler to sit down with three or four of these guys in the back of my buddy's restaurant put some cameras up and just let them tell stories. Yeah. Buy them a steak and a beer and just let them go. And man, it's, it's just, it's, it's awesome history that for some reason, nobody's really covered. So how are you maintaining this history? I mean, obviously you've got the cars but, and you're doing some of these recordings, but what else are you doing? Because I'm seeing a lot of pieces and parts <laughs> laying around here um, that are, you know, who's, who's got molds for noses? 
Bill well, Ryan does. Well, we, we so so where are you finding this stuff, and and why are you keeping it? We copied all the noses and tails back to the original race nose in '87. T Bird Ford got the first aftermarket nose in 1987. Um, we've copied all this because there's going to come a time where you can't find originals anymore. So if we don't it's coming quick, right? right? I mean, it's pretty much here, right? And if you so if we don't mold them and save them, the poor guy that does race his car or that takes it to a show and cracks a nose unloading it, he can't get another one. So we actually have spent a lot of time and money just saving bits. For instance, when Jerry Stahl was going out of business, closing up, he was just, he was done, you know. We went up and bought every header, every fixture, every pattern he had for the NASCAR stuff. Um, when Tom Palton closed the chassis shop down at Hutchinson Pagan in 2005, we went and bought everything. Um, if, if it goes to scrap, it's gone forever. Yeah. If we can save it, we have it. Now, granted, I don't have the 80,000 square feet I need to put everything out, <laughs> but we at least have it safe somewhere um, so that it's not lost forever. That's incredible. And I, I'm seeing a couple of uh, Texaco Havlin stars over here. Um, That's a super cool car. That is, that is actually Fido. That is the car that Davey won. The far won. one, the white yeah. one. All the way in the end. That's the one that Davey won his second race in at Dover. And uh, Joey Knuckles was out here verifying that car. Oh, yeah, he sure. Tells, he's another one, remembers everything. Absolutely. He is so great to talk to about the older cars. Um, but he came out and verified that one for me, and it's a super cool car. This Davey Allison car, this is back when Davey was running Luminas in the Bush Series and Fords in the Cup Series. And Ford came to him and said, hey, you got to stop that. You can't win races in Chevrolets and then Fords. It just yeah. it doesn't work. And they, so they tried to get Ford to give them money to convert everything to Fords. Ford didn't have anything in the budget at that time because mid-season. So they made a deal where, what if we just change them to Buicks? So the last 11 races, I think of 1991, they ran Buicks instead of Luminous to keep Ford happy. This is one of those V6 Buicks that year that we ended up with. So really cool car, beautiful piece, V6 in it, just like it's supposed to be. Um, and that was another neat one we found because the original body and stickers all faded and rotted, but they were all still there. They were there. There was no question. Yeah. yeah. So what are these just chassis up here? Um, is it ones that are not finished, but they're not at your other shop? They're over here. Why? Yeah, just for storage. So the okay. one on the very end there is just a, a banjo rear steer chassis we have if we ever need it. The second one over is a, one of the Red Bull chassis. We did their street legal program at my company, so uh -huh. that's one of the leftover street legal chassis. I saved this because the first COT race was at Sonoma. Yep. And Michael Walter put Terry Labonte in his car just so they had a champion's provisional if they needed it. That is the Terry Labonte Napa car oh, from wow. Sonoma. Um, so I saved it just to have. Um, I thought that was a cool piece. And, and not a big fan of the newer cars, but like Terry Labonte, and, and it was just something cool to have. Mm -hmm. This is a special one. So this is a Cale Yarbrough 1976, 77, 78 Holly Farms car. This is a three-time oh, wow. championship winning car. Uh, funny story behind this. So a lot of guys know in racing, Gover Sosby used to run liquor for Junior back in the day. <laughs> so <laughs> That might be the greatest line you've ever yeah. said to me. <laughs> so when David Sosby, his son, was going to step up from late model racing to ARCA racing, they went over to Junior's and Gover told him, hey, my boy's going to race. We want a good car. And Junior said, for you, the price is this. Pick any car in the shop you want, but that one just won Ontario. So they said, well, hell, we'll take that one. So David raced it a couple times. They switched to the short wheelbase cars, and thank goodness David didn't cut it up. Yeah. He parked it in a chicken coop. In a chicken on coop. Blocks, yep, on blocks, covered in plastic, just like you see it. And it sat there for, well, till we drug it out with our rental car. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I guess that's a... You know, barn finds. Yes. Right? Well, what a barn find today. But if I'm, if I'm looking for one of these, are they still sitting around in barns? Or is everything pretty much the guys within the business know where everything's at? Um, yes, they're still out there. But you've really got to be careful what's fake and what's real. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you the difference is when we first started looking for these cars years ago, we'd find six or seven real ones a year. Now we find one maybe two. Um, so so it, it's definitely slowed up. There's more people looking. Um, you know, Ray, Ray and, Ray's always looking for something cool. He's got yeah. some beautiful stuff over in his collection. Um, so it's not, as, it's not as easy to find them as it used to be. You've got just about every uh, generation in here too. Um, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. Do you have, 
an era that you're more fond of than another? I like the late seventies through the eighties to, you know, to the early nineties. That, that's my favorite. Um, and I'm only, I'm, I'm 44 years old. So I didn't get, I didn't get to go to Martinsville and watch, you know, 31 of these chrome bumper big cars beat the snot like out one. of each other for 500 laps. I, yeah. I, to this day, I think that would be one of the coolest things to see in person. And I never got to see it, but um, I, I do love that era. I really do. All right, so I'm seeing more AJ Orange back here. That is the, that is the original uh, 1980, 1979, 1980 Olds 442. That car did finish third at Daytona. Wow. That year. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that, actually, Jeff Burton drove that around Darlington a couple years ago when Mark drove the other car. We took it out there and let him run it around. It's another original as sits, and we just, you know, she's race ready and she's absolutely gorgeous. She could use a little bit of loving, but again, it's another one I don't wish to restore because it's still as I, I don't nice blame as it you. is. And more Jeff and, and a Jimmy Johnson car, but what what is this? I mean, I'm, Holman Moody, this this uh, Falcon, um, not a regular cup car. No, and, and this <laughs> was actually something that Lee Holman put together to run over in Europe, and it's uh, it was kind of a cross between a Falcon and a and a Fairlane. Or a Thunderbolt. It, it, it a little, little bit of everything? A little weird when we first got it. Absolutely beautiful car. I see he signed a well. dash. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we have some friends, actually, uh, Klaus Graf, American yeah. Le Mans champion. He comes over and races this thing on occasion and, and has a, a really good time with it. And um, it's just a neat old toy. For, it takes about a day to get the 427 big block out from under that hood compartment. It, it's, it's a chore, but it's a fun toy. Super I bet. cool toy. I bet. So, I know you married, Bill. Um, does your wife think you're completely insane? <laughs> or give us the tip that the rest of us can use with our wives or girlfriends, <laughs> how we can talk them into letting us have a collection like this. I tell you what, my wife is spectacular. because she, she's, she's put up with this for years. And she knows the passion. And she's not a big race fan. She, she knows the industry because she works with me at work and she gets it. But she's not, you know... She's not going to go to the racetrack with you and, and sit in the grandstands and, and swig a beer and, and, you know, it's just, but she understands it from the historical aspect and why we do what we do. And she, she's quite amazing. <laughs> she really is. I assume uh, the PRI industry helps you a lot with this because there's no way you can put all this together without pieces and parts from other yes. Members of PRI. Yes, we have. I mean, it, like like I said earlier, it, it's our network of people as far as you know, distributors of parts and pieces, and like even our cores. You know, our cores come from a, a PRI distributor for our radiators that we remanufacture all the tanks and stuff from. You know, if if we didn't have that network, this would never happen. None of it. So what's what's the dream? What's the goal? I mean, I guess you're living the dream, right? They're here. They're in your facility. You can come look at them, sit in them, drive them whenever you want. <laughs> um, what's, what's the plan? What are you dreaming of getting next? And uh, how often do you exercise them? I have, believe it or not, this is, this, is, this is the anal bill, Ryan. Once I restore one, it looks too pretty to take to the track. A lot of guys do, and I love them for it, but I can't do it. So I do have one that I, that I race. I have a 2002 John Andretti Petty Dodge. Okay. And I do play with that on the road courses. Love it. Have a, the best time with it. Um, but as far as these, once we get them restored, we kind of just put them up and, and, and just let them age like fine wine, really. I mean, some people would say that's not what you're supposed to do with them, but man, I, I love them. They're gorgeous.